Yeah. Great. So, good evening, everyone. I welcome you to the webinar on resilient design for your building. This is the last webinar of our ten-part webinar series, and we have a very special guest with us today. I am Yashima Jain, and I'll be moderating today's session for you. Now, first, I would like to thank the Department of Science and Technology and the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy for their support. Also, a big thank you to the sponsors and affiliates of Solar Decathlon India. Now, here are a few announcements for today. Remember, December 31 is the last date for you to complete the self-learning modules. Each member of your team must complete them before the deadline. and we want to we want you to make use of the knowledge tools and other resources that are made available to you and be successful in your solar decathlon india challenge now once you complete all the 10 self learning modules you will be awarded with a certificate you can download your certificate from the learning online platform and lastly we are rolling out quiz number 2 on december 10 11 and 12 this will be based on the last five modules and the details about the quiz have been announced on the learning online platform so have fun competing now today we have with us ashok lal who is a member of the supervisory group of solar decathlon india he is committed to architecture based on the principles of environmental sustainability and social responsibility his firm has won a number of awards and its work has been published widely engaged in architectural education since 1990 he has developed curricula and teaching methods to address environmental issues he has published many articles and presented papers on environmentally sustainable design and has been an active member of institutions and groups promoting awareness and building competence in sustainable design of buildings today ashok lal will discuss why resilience and adaptation is now critical at a building site and community level along with case studies with strategies to reduce risk and vulnerability as always you are free to send in your questions at any time during the webinar and we will take as many questions as time allows after the session and with that it's over to you sir thank you yashima and hello to everybody who's there So Yashima is going to move the slides on for me. She is the person who will will help me in turning the slides over. So what we see here in this picture is our latest event, disastrous event that came to us here in India, which has to do with climate change. This is Cyclone Nivar, and you can see this picture right here. it's very fresh in our memories next yashima and the amazing thing is that this hazard of cyclones it seems to emerge on the seas and then it often moves in a swirling fashion towards land and we are now able to predict its intensity its direction its duration and here you can see that although it is essentially an event that arises on the seas but it has an impact deep inland and here it is reaching right up to bangalore so this is something now which is understood and recognized and it means that we need to be able to take precautions when we hear of a cyclone coming next so as we said that it is something to do with being on the coast which is most vulnerable on the left you see how the sea 
is the storm is building up the waves and they're, they're hitting the coast and then they're rushing, the water is rushing in. On the other hand, it's raining very hard. And the impact of all of this is deep inland. And you can see right up the horizon on the right-hand picture, it's water, it's flooded. Next. So it's not just the place that is vulnerable. What we are really concerned about is the vulnerability of persons, of communities, of their livelihoods, of their properties that they've built up over years of toil and struggle. And this picture is really uh, quite a telling picture because here you have a couple where the lady is about to give birth to a baby and they have to rush to the hospital. And well, just see that if you're besieged by flooding on the street and you don't have proper access and you don't have proper arrangements for getting, getting to meet your emergencies like this one, well, it means there's not sufficient preparedness, doesn't it? And you're more vulnerable. Next. So if you're talking about preparedness, you know, we did get a warning in good time and there was community action, as you can see on the left-hand picture with, the, um, with all the fishermen carrying the boats to shore, to higher levels. And on the right-hand side, yes, it does happen. Disaster relief is present, it's organized and it does turn up, there is some level of preparedness. And this is quite a crazy picture because you see these people dressed in orange clothing, wearing, wearing caps and wearing, I mean, this is COVID time, right? And they're wearing these visors outside so as if they're going to the moon for protection or something like that. But you can see it can hit you in so many different ways. Next. Well, here's an estimate of how much it has cost. What is the degree of loss, especially to agriculture in this case? 400 crore rupees worth of loss because of this. So, you know, so we looked at people, communities, property, but actual financial losses, the loss of wealth really puts you back severely. Next. So here's a question for us. What is the task of our designers? Designers of the built environment? Well, the task is very simply to minimize vulnerability and optimize preparedness. Next. We, was, we were just looking at the coast and an event that happened at the coast. But now there is this very good vulnerability atlas prepared by the Center for Science and Environment. And it looks at different ge geographic regions of the, of the Indian Peninsula. Um, this one is about vulnerability, vulnerabilities along the coast. And it also tells you there's a lot of people living in this area. And if you look at the picture on the bottom left, you'll see it's talking about the possibility of sea, with sea level rise inundating chunks of land close to the sea. Next picture. Here's another one, which is looking at the, the central and peninsular India, right? And it is really predicting the possibility of droughts as temperatures rise, a different kind of vulnerability. So it's quite important for us to know if we are designing this project for, for the solar decathlon, where we are located and identify our vulnerabilities so that we can anticipate them, anticipate their intensity and take precautionary measures accordingly. Next. But here's the irony of it all. Well, we have had some vulnerabilities historically but now some of these things are increasing manifold because of climate change. But we are saddled with our history of settlements. As you can see in this map, 
the concentrations of populations are often along the coast. They are growing and continuing to grow. And then there are some other concentrations in the heart of the peninsula and also at the top of the Indo-Gangetic Plain. So we are confronted with the fact that we've already invested and we are living somewhere and we have to cope with the vulnerabilities that are coming our way due to climate change primarily. Next. Well, you know, we associate uh, these, this climate change dramatically with extreme events. You know, heavy rainfall and flooding, cyclones, uh, floods, as you say, and even earthquakes, which is a separate thing, but you get tsunamis, which are like an earthquake, that can also occur. Uh, something which is a bit of a longer term affair is the growth of drought regions, the spread of droughts. And heat waves, they can last for a few days and they can disappear. You can even get cold waves. But these seem to be like extreme events. They come and go, right? They're like hazardous events. Next slide. But we forget something. That while the resilience, this need for resilience has been thought of, in the context of extreme events, uh, the reality of climate change is that it is creeping upon us almost imperceptibly on three fronts. Local temperatures are rising across the globe. Droughts are likely to spread and sea levels are rising. These are things that are happening slowly, imperceptibly, and we don't sense that danger adequately, you know, in our day-to-day -day lives. Next. Now, at the, uh, the climate conference, or the COP21, where 195 countries decided that they're going to take action to reduce the carbon emissions over the next couple of decades, to try and hold the rise in global temperatures below two degrees centigrade, right? Uh, now, this is quite important. We are talking about, this is that incipient change that you hardly notice, but it is something that if you're designing buildings that, can, that are going to last 50 years, 70 years, or even 100 years, you've got to anticipate this rise in temperature. And the way you design and operate your buildings is also going to be the kind of strategy that will help in reducing carbon emissions. So you start mitigating on that front. Next. Well, this is a very useful diagram to see where you stand in terms of the kind of hazard that you might face how vulnerable you are, and how well you're prepared. And your total vulnerability is dependent on the, the intensity of the hazard, which you can do very little about. If it comes your way, it comes, you know, you can't do very much about the hazard coming your way. But you can do something about how vulnerable you are to that hazard. If you're very vulnerable, then you can see the bottom left hand arrow pulling yourself out, pulling the whole thing out. And if you're not prepared, then this triangle becomes big. So what's the strategy? The strategy is to reduce the size of the triangle by working on what? And working on pr protection on one side and preparedness on the other side. Next. And now you might be wondering, where does our little project for the solar decathlon belong in this very large global story? Well, if you look at it carefully, the solar decathlon challenge is a microcosm of the global challenge for the design, production, and management of the built environment. As you work on this challenge, you will feel your connection to the global challenge. You will learn the strategies that are applicable, not only locally, but globally. It's really a way of starting the movement from your position in this small project 
to understand what can be done at a global level. Next. So it's a very important project that you're doing. And you are key players. All your competitors are key players. Well, here's another set of statements or terms. So, you know, resilience is really defined as the ability to get out of uh, having been put down by a big event or a hazard. So you've been put down and you've lost a lot, but the ability to be able to rise again and come back to normal and become productive, safe and healthy once again. The, quick, the more quickly you can do it, the better you can do it, the more resilient you are. But we are looking at something else. We are looking at something else. In our strategies of building, on the one side, if you look at the right hand term, adaptation, we have to maintain our well being in the long term against the impacts of climate change that are gradually growing upon us. So, there you have to think globally because climate change is a global phenomenon and you have to act locally. And on the left hand side, the way you go about doing all of this, your, your design for the buildings, also needs to be a mitigating strategy. It means that you work on a cumulative impact of individual local actions combined with global actions to contain climate change. In our case, primarily by reducing CO2 emissions uh, or greenhouse gas emissions in the making production and the operational buildings. So here you're acting locally as well as acting globally. When this is in sync, a movement develops which can save us from the impact of climate change in the long term. Next. So that was a bit of background about, you know, what, what the context is about resilience. And let us see how in design, you can, you can kind of address it. So here, is, here are some sketches which show uh, the development of a master plan for the IIT at Jodhpur in the middle of the desert. So there the hazards that they face is sand drift, flash floods, temperature rise. But look at the way the design is developed. It's very interesting. What they choose to do is against the wind that is coming, you know, bringing the sand over the space, sort of the wind is say blowing from the left hand side, you raise buns in kind of crescent formation. And these buns become a way of diverting the movement of the wind upwards. So you're away on the leeward side, you're away from the impact of the hot winds on the one hand. And you also have a way of arresting the building of the spread of sand or sand drift onto the site that you want to occupy. And this is a kind of a disaster proofing idea. And you create an environment on the, on the leeward side of the crescent shapes of these mounds where you begin to occupy the space. So it's a kind of a disaster proofing strategy at a landscape scale. It's really very simple as an idea. It's quite a durable thing also. And this crescent shape also becomes a way of being able to capture whatever rainwater comes and bringing it into storage spaces or um, bringing it down into the ground uh, for to be used later on. And so this water then becomes a way of sustaining life. And the idea is that even in the desert, if you manage your water well, you can be water autonomous, at least work towards it. Next. And here's a picture of the whole thing developed. All right. So we did say that this is, you know, you can, now you can see, imagine yourself that you're on the side from which we're looking at this picture, that the wind is blowing from this direction. And now the bund has also got plantation growing on it because you've collected some water and I've used that for irrigation, gradually started to stabilize the buns with plantation and you have now protected your settlement in this interesting way. And look at the way 
even the organization of buildings and the spaces between buildings in this layout is very telling because what it does is it that places the longer face of the buildings towards north and south generally a parallel kind of arrangement of buildings but even with that parallel arrangement it is able to modulate courtyards you know habitable outdoor spaces which are somewhat protected and so with the principle of proper orientation and mutual shading and small spaces outside the building which can also become over in the overall sense a bit more comfortable and protected you know it's a really good idea of, of a method of uh, of a passive system for the settlement as a whole a passive design that modifies the the microclimate of the set settlement as and then of course you're thinking of being autonomous in water and if you look at the next picture i think we might also see that there is a proposal for setting up a solar farm next door not very far from it so that now you can also become autonomous on power okay and this model can spawn small babies and other as the institution grows more settlements can be formed following a similar system of design or similar strategies of design and so this is about you know you never look at a settlement or a or a design in itself you look at how it is connected to other settlements other external systems and how linking upwards into those settlements can also give you certain amount of resilience because if one one place fails you can borrow from the next one if one place gets inundated you can move to the next one etc next well that was the desert and now we are in mumbai and what's the hazard in mumbai at one time it was thought that the sea level is going to rise a little bit not very much and some little edges of the mumbai peninsula are going to be affected but now the new projections for 2050 if you can see on the right hand picture is showing just with 80 cm or 1 m rise in the in the in the sea level and don't forget this is tidal situation you know it's what high rise high tide and low tide so general sea level is rising high tide rises even further so you are subjecting a lot of area to inundation now this is a reality i can tell you that no one in mumbai is worried about it today they haven't seen this creeping effect yet next but who has seen it it's students of architecture have seen it so yeah they're trying to say that there is a slum settlement which is next to the water which is you know land which nobody else wants it is subject to all kinds of erosion and inundation in the future but now they wrestle with this idea of actually building a bund along the edge digging out uh from the from 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 the sands dips where water which is which is coming in from upstream on the left hand side or rising up as as the tide rises for water to have more space to stay before it begins to rise to a level where it can inundate inundate the settlement so protection of the settlement and the design accordingly is what they are talking about and you know this cannot be done if the people who are being rehoused the slum population that are being rehoused don't understand why it's being done there must be user knowledge and the users the people who are living there the residents must also be prepared for what is going to come in the future or what might come in the future next so here to paul yeah so uh, we will be sharing a link with you in the chat window and um, to take a part in the poll kindly click on the link and you can share your answers or responses over there and uh, once that's done we'll share results and discuss it in brief so amanda um, can you share the link yeah yes ma'am i've shared the link in the chat box uh, yeah okay. for all of you Please. who are there let me just say 
And we saw two projects. One was a tiny mini one, it's just a student idea. The other one is a real project that's actually now been built. Uh, the Jodhpur uh, uh, IIT uh, campus. So think of both the projects as you respond to this question. Yeah, so we'll wait for 30, around 30 seconds and uh, we'll share the results after that. <clears throat> Um, Amanda, can we share the results now? Yeah, sure. I'll, so. Yeah, Shima, yeah. there was a hand raised. Right. Um, um, so what, if you have any query, you can post your questions in the Q&A window and we'll take it up after the session is over. Uh, Yashima, I have pasted the answer. I think we can share it now. Okay, great. Mm. Thank you, Amanda. So... Yeah, here are the results that we have received from the audience. Hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Very, very interesting. Of course, a lot of people have gone beyond what we talked about or pointed out in the, in, in the description of the projects. Uh, things like pins and uh, funnel effect and all that. These are more detailed considerations which would be there, part of the design eventually. Uh, it's good that you've, you are now beginning to look at all the scales, the detailed scale, as well as how it connects to the larger scale of operation. And usually in such things, the larger scale of operation actually gives you the greatest effect and the smaller scale of operation then refines it even further. So unless, if you hadn't built the bund, the individual building is not going to do very much for you. But if you built the bund, then the individual brain building is freer and can respond to more detailed or more local circumstances after being protected. Very interesting indeed. And there's somebody mentioned vernacular elements. I suppose you're talking about courtyards, there's a reservoir, a lake. And of course, there must be innovative technology, although I don't know what that is, but there must be. Yep. Biofencing too. Very good. Right, now we move on. We're talking about temperatures rising, right? And we, we saw this slide which said that we're trying to hold the temperatures down, the rise in global average temperatures down to below two degrees centigrade. That's what we're trying to do globally. But even if it were to rise to one and a half degrees centigrade globally, this globally actually means globally, as an average of the entire surface of the globe. So over the sea, it may not rise quite as much, but over land masses, the rise in temperature would be greater. And in the land masses, where people have built cities, it will be even greater because of something that we have now, what we know about, called the urban heat island effect because of the hard paving of the surfaces and the mass of the buildings, what is tending to happen at, at certain times of the day, you will get the temperature rising even more. So while on the outskirts of the city, let's say the temperature in the evening is 35 degrees centigrade, 
at eight o'clock in the evening, but in the heart of the city, it could be up to 42 degrees centigrade. That's how it can be. Now imagine how this can peak at certain times, right? When this, when, you know, the worst time of the year, hottest season, the wind isn't blowing, um, and it's become very humid and everybody wants air conditioning. Temperatures have peaked all of a sudden. Switch on the air conditioning and the grid failure occurs. Electricity is down because you can't cope with that peak. So it's not only about the rise of two degrees or one and a half degrees centigrade of temperature that we are looking at. We are looking at the urban heat island effect as well as the possibilities of peaks occurring. Okay, move on to the next one. So now we are into cities, right? We were looking at the coast and we we're looking at the desert. Now we are into the city and here's an industrial project in, in Greater Noida. Um, and you know, even in Noida, uh, we're getting flash floods and of course we are confronting temperature rise. So um, this project has had to take some measures to make sure that they don't, they don't get flooded out. So they've raised their property somewhat and they've, they've, uh, they have produced two big water bodies where water can drain into during the time it is raining very hard and then it can gradually sink in and if it fills right up then it'll have to be pumped out. But some sort of holding pond system to take care of flash or heavy rainfall during you know, a storm, which has a short duration. It lasts for one hour or two hours, and then after that peters off. But you don't let that kind of heavy rainfall suddenly flood your space. And you can take some measures at the site level to take care of it. Other than that, you can see the office building on the right-hand side, which is just a courtyard building. And it really is focused a lot on passive performance, simple ways without using active systems to minimize the impact of the external factors on the indoor environment. And in this kind of project where there is of course a very defined community of people who work here, they all know now why the buildings have been designed in this particular manner and what they must do if the temperatures keep rising then you don't expect to be at the same level of comfort as you were when it is pleasant weather. You must understand that. And you must be prepared if the, if the bijli fails, you must be prepared that now it's time to open the windows. That's the way to live. So you, you do need to have user knowledge and preparedness to take care of those factors that are going to be hurting you or possibly hurting you in the future. Next. Well, a very important um, strategy or very important principle of design is to think of solutions that are pretty straightforward and simple. So if you want to have um, you know, good lighting, good ventilation in your space, in case you don't have air conditioning, and if in case you don't have electricity, then uh, you might want to have a building which is only so deep as you know you have a passage which circulates around the courtyard and on either side of the passage are rooms and all those rooms are not so deep so that they can get the, the benefit of ventilation by opening the windows and can get benefit of daylighting. All right. And the shape of the building is very straightforward being squarish or almost square. Similarly, the small area that is open to the outside on the courtyard side, overall, the perimeter area of the building in relation to its floor area is sought to be reduced. If you have a very a complicated building which has a lot of jagged shapes and edges, you're exposing yourself much more. And so your passive performance actually goes down or you have to take much more precaution in terms of insulation and so on to protect yourself from the outside. So simple shape is usually a good answer. Next. Now, not only a simple shape, the, 
Um, so here you have the outer skin, which is well insulated using this box type construction, which is partly storage. And it is also a space for running some air conditioning ducts. The roof is also insulated with a roof garden on top of it. Okay. And in this case, for some distance, even at the ground floor, under the floor slab, there is insulation. So the idea is that if you want to have what we call air conditioned comfort indoors, and if you want to minimize the energy required for conditioning the indoors, then you want to minimize the amount of heat that would enter from the outside to the inside. And then of course you must have very good and tight windows so that you don't get any leaking of hot air from the outside to the inside or loss of the cool from inside to the outside. So building envelope design is extremely important. And then the box shapes automatically become shading systems. And you can see here on the left-hand side that there's an extension to the building that protects it from the southwestern side. Next. Well, another aspect of passive performance, and I think this is often forgotten, is the value of thermal mass uh, of the building fabric itself. So in this case, what has been done is that the floor slabs, which are thick concrete slabs, have got these pipes which are embedded in them. And through these pipes, you run chilled water uh, at a temperature so that it's not so cold that you will get condensation inside, but still it's chilled water. This is actually a very efficient way of getting cooling in the space because our bodies are very sensitive to, to radiation or radiant uh, temperatures that surround us much more sensitive to radiant temperatures than it is to the contact of air that is next to us. So this system is of radiant cooling and this radiant cooling is then modulated through the year. It turns into radiant heating a little bit for the winter. This is in the Delhi region. And in the good season, if the air is clean outside, you can actually open your windows and just run the ventilation system. Here again, to operate a building like this at its most efficient levels, people must know how to use it. So you must have experts who understand how to operate all those systems and the occupants themselves should understand how the building is supposed to be used. Next. Another issue which is quite important is that we often, when we are designing buildings, we, we don't think of the immediate spaces outside the building. Like we saw in this one, that on the roof, we built a garden. On the outer face, we built a protected wall, which is shaded, and there also, there are, there's plantation. There's a courtyard that has a pool of water with a fountain which trickles, uh, which cools the courtyard down, and it has plantation here too. So you can actually modify the microclimate around the building, and you must consider the space immediately around the building as integral to the design of the building itself. That is part of passive performance. And it's very interesting that, you know, this is very simple to do. And it's also that if, because of shortage of water, it doesn't work, it doesn't work so well, or there, there is, you know, it takes time for the plants to grow. You may say, this is actually an added benefit. It could be called a redundant advantage, but it is there, it is going to be an advantage. And when electricity fails and you have to open your windows to use this space, it is these plants and this small water fountain that is going to give you the sense of comfort. Next. Well, this building has been tested through COVID. And they had to switch off the air conditioning system for fear that you might, uh, you might be uh, you know, sending the virus out to all the occupants over here by blowing it through the air conditioning system. They switched it off, but they kept the radiant system open. And that gave them quite a good 
you know, a good deal of comfort. And then when it was pleasant time, they actually opened the windows. Uh, and so having windows that you can open um, was a good resilient, resilient strategy in this case. And is built into the notion that, you know, normally it is fully air conditioned, the windows are kept closed, except when it is really nice weather. But even when you may not have air conditioning, the windows come in useful. And so it's an integral part of the resilience of the design. Next. Well, everything that could be done, protecting the building from the outside by insulation, giving, giving it a simple shape, painting it with very light colors which are reflective, clothing it with plantation all around and in the courtyard and using a trickle fountain as a, ways of, as a way of cooling down the space outside, outside the windows. You reduce the load on the air conditioning system. You minimize the consumption of energy. You've also made sure that it is very well daylit as you could see from the pictures. Now to make up for it, they have put a large photovoltaic array on the adjacent factory set. And now the building is near net zero. That's where it is getting to. If they add a bit more solar PV, they'll be there altogether. So it's a combination of all of these elements, starting from the passive design and the environmental design around the buildings that gives you the possibility of net zero. Next. I just want to say a little bit about you know, building types. Um, it can be said that the greater the complexity, the greater the requirement for robustness and redundancy. If, you know, think of an, think of an aircraft, because it's such a complicated thing, you really have to make sure that systems can't go wrong. And if one thing goes wrong, something else will come in its place and make it work and you'll get good warning and everything is kept in extremely good condition running all the time because safety is so important, but it's a very complex system, all right? Um, so, as a principle, once again, the simpler you can keep things, the better it will be because your requirements for robustness and redundancy will become lesser and therefore it will be more reliable as a system in the long run. Think of these three buildings, low rise, medium rise, high rise. Think of the risk, the hazards and risks which are listed on the left hand side and just check in these boxes. See which one is more risky and which one is less risky, which one is exposed to greater hazard and which one is exposed to less hazard. It is to do with the building type itself and how that building type, the high rise building type is inviting complexity and the low rise building type is in inviting simplicity on the other hand in comparison. So I just want to bring this out. Don't make things too complicated. Next. Now coming to a city, uh, a small plot in the heart of Delhi, um, and you have to build with, you know, with the given setbacks, et cetera. There's very little you can do in terms of managing the site or the external areas around the building. You have to manage within it. And yet, you know, the streets can get flooded. Uh, and in Delhi is now beginning to see some water shortage once again. Temperatures are gradually rising. And as I mentioned earlier, power systems do fail during the height of the summer and water, can, water systems can also fail. Even inside your building, your water systems can fail. Next. So what does the building do? Once again, it follows the same principle of a simple shape, minimizing the exposure to the outside, small courtyard to which more there's more opening and there's more controlled opening on the outer faces. The outer faces are balconies and shade screens on the outside, right? So for passive performance, the overall strategy of the form of the building and its organization is what we are seeing here. And it's something that will last forever. It's a very simple strategy. Once again, you have a garden on the rooftop to protect you from the impact of the sun at the top. But you know what's not properly proofed here? There's a, there's a pool of water at the basement level.
Now, if the street were to flood and the water was to rush into the stilt level where the cars are parked, it's not really been thought through this carefully. The basement can get flooded. So I don't think this has been, you know, that particular part of disaster proofing has not had sufficient foresight in this design. On the other hand, the basement in itself is actually a really good refuse. When it's hot outside and electricity systems have failed, you may have, you know, you can all go down to the basement, run a small fan to exhaust some air and run the ceiling fan with a little bit of electricity, which can be stored in a battery and remain comfortable. At least you can get a good night's sleep. So from that point of view, for the community living here, this is an advantage, but there is a vulnerability of flooding. Next. Once again, special care is taken on the outer face of the building to insulate it well. And so you've got this uh, a, 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 a concrete block with, with sandwich insulation in between. And notice how the insulation covers the structure from the outside. It avoids the thermal bridging of, you know, otherwise if you only were to insulate the walling that is between the structural elements of the beam and the floor, then the, the side of the beam and the edges of the floor become exposed to the outside and collect all the heat. So they become thermal bridges. So here the detailing is such that the thermal bridging is avoided. And similarly, when you get a, um, um, a balcony, so the balcony is also separated from the main structure by a thermal break. A little bit of complicated construction, but certainly worth doing over here. And it is outside on the outer face of the balcony that you have screens that you can manipulate for shading against the sun. And here you can get a picture of how the middle, uh, this courtyard is supposed to be a kind of a cooling device. Next. The pool that you saw at the bottom of the courtyard uh, is a fairly large pool around which the basement is, is wrapped. And this cool has a fountain. That fountain brings the water of the, the temperature of the water in the pool to a near wet bulb. And now this cool water can be circulated in the floor slabs of the building above. So it's similar to the office building we saw earlier, except that here the cooling of the water is being done just by evaporation, right? No compressor is used for cooling. So it takes away quite a lot of the heat, this simple method. The benefit of this system in terms of temperature differential goes down a little bit when you come to the humid season. But on the other hand, this system of removing heat does not add any moisture to the inside. Not, you know, it's like indirect evaporative cooling in, my, in a sense, you might say. Very, it's actually once installed, it's a very simple system to run. And you might even say, well, if one part of it fails, the other part of the, you know, because there are several loops in, the, in, in one floor plan, there are several loops. If one loop fails for some reason, you can go to the other rooms and still get the comfort. So this is reduces reduce the need for running the air conditioner in the high heat and humid season of Delhi for very short periods. And it's really the passive performance of the building, which is interesting. There's a question mark against simplicity. We'll see that in a little while. Next. You know, the building has many integrated systems. Uh, for instance, it has uh, water treatment and recycling, rainwater storage, and they're all interconnected one with the other. Um, there is a system of battery storage. They're going to add a solar PV system on the roof. Um, and there is a, a maintenance manual that has been given to the, to the owners and clients. And they have in turn made a simpler um, manual for all the occupants, tenants and owners in the building. They've done that. But you know, managing all of this is not a simple task because there are many integrated systems. I wish it could be simpler. And I know the gentleman who owns this building 
and was very passionate about it. You know how much he worries sometimes at night. कहीं ये तो कहीं this valve is not left open or is that thing working or not and he's constantly monitoring it. So I'm not sure if this is the simplest solution, although you know technically it is very well uh, automated, very well integrated, and it is looking for autonomy in water and it's almost got there by the way, storing a lot of rainwater and using the water very efficiently and also recycling a uh, treated water. and it can be autonomous on power if you don't because the air conditioning demand has gone down sufficiently and yes there is user knowledge and there is user prepared preparedness too next while the shading screens here it so happens that you know these shading screens are are, man are manipulable they are movable and the occupants can move them they're not automated so depending on whether it's troubling you or not you can move them up and down in winters you can open up and receive the sunshine in summers you can close them in the daytime you can close them in the nighttime you can open them and where there's a tree already giving the protection there's no need for a shading screen because the tree is doing the job you know this is originally it was planned but it was eventually not actually built because it was not necessary and this is quite a simple technique having shade screens on the outside that you can manipulate next here you can see them being manipulated next okay can you identify yes. the opportunities used in this project yes so again like we did bef in before we will be sharing a link in the chat window and uh, kindly click on the link to take part in this poll and we will share uh, the results after that amanda can you please share the link yeah the link has been shared everybody you, you can you know yeah great thanks amanda one thing just a tip i i didn't quite point out in this residential project is that there is it's a substantial thermal mass in the floor slabs and the external walls which is protected from the outside by good insulation and that's like for for climates where composite climates particularly or even hot dry climates by the temperature day and night and even seasonally varies considerably uh this kind of thermal flywheel effect that you get from heavy mass protected from the outside is quite beneficial right so um amanda can we have the results now yeah sure uh, yashima i'll share the results um uh, yes yeah you can share the result it's ready now Mm, great um yeah so um so here are the results uh, from this poll mm my god there's a whole lot of stuff over here very interesting some of it i can't quite read trees passe chajas water is warm and yeah the courtyard as a kind of a device uh which is a kind of a central cooler if you like that kind of an idea at least um is is a, is is central to that strategy and then of course shading from the outside is central to the strategy and use of thermal mass sure orientation we were not able to control in this case because the building was you know determined so much by where the plot is located and where the street is you couldn't really control the orientation but you take you take uh, steps in dealing with the sun falling on the building by allowing for those shade screens outside yeah yep 
Yep. Uh, we'll move ahead. Yes. Back. Oh, swinging back from the heart of the city now to the estuary of the Ganga and the Brahmaputra, Sundarbans. And you know, before this last storm that we had, this is the, this is the previous one, the Amphan, which inundated the Sundarbans area. And see, these huts are built by people, local people, who have come and settled in Sundarbans from other areas, you know, from Odisha and from Bihar, they come and settled here. Um, but they were used to building buildings on the ground. They didn't know that you can build buildings on stilts, right? And they, they continue to do that. So here's a curious thing, you know, whether we are in cities or in villages and there are certain traditions and there are certain notions of what a building is. So we have the weight of what we have received. Location, existing situations, buildings, and habits of living and building. Uh, which we also have to deal with when we're talking about resilience. And here you can see the houses being completely inundated. Next. And here's the river with the, you know, these are tidal rivers. And when it rains very hard, like in this storm, the river rises. And the only thing that is left above the water level are these buns that connect from village to village or surround the islands, okay? So these have been built by human effort to be raised above the surrounding water. And this is the only place where you can go to if you're flooded out. Next. So when this disaster happened, there was a flurry of activity and some proposals were, were made about, you know, what to do. Let's build a disaster resilience center. And so how, where do you build it? You build it on top of the bund. How do you build it? You build it very quickly with prefabricated means. In fact, you build it in such a way that you can even lift it off and take it elsewhere if you need it. Or you can build it longer or shorter according to where, you know, how many people will want to use it, etc. So it is a strategy that allows for dealing with different circumstances of need for size and location, and also, uh, uh, what's the word for it? You can move it around, all right? Um, I don't know what the word for that is, but, uh, and you rise clear above the water. Now here again, there was discussion with the local community, you know, what if we build a center like this? Say, so what is this up in the sky? What kind of a building is this? We don't know, right? But it's a solution. And if they accept it, they will know what the value of the solution is and they will be prepared to move there when required. Next. It's a very simple, straightforward way of building. Here it is. The cattle stays on the bund. People can move up. They can take, they can sleep there. They can cook there. They can take their medicines up there. It can be used as a school, if you like. It can be used as a small hospital or a clinic, etc. So it's just a multi-purpose space. And look at the way the roof completely shades from the sides and just allows the wind to pass through, a little bit of wind to pass through. And there's not much to be done in terms of thermal comfort. It's really about rescue operation. Next. Now that was the Sundarbans. You know, a whole region that is threatened by sea level rise. Now we shift continents and we go to the Netherlands. We know these pictures of the windmills in the Netherlands. You know, I used to think that these are mills for grinding grain. But when I went there and I discovered they're actually pumps that pump water. Next. So it so happens that the Netherlands is the river basin for two big river systems that come from, uh, from Western Europe and discharge into the North Sea. And that's where the Netherlands are located. Next. And 60% of the land is below sea level where 9 million people live. 
my gosh, why people should choose to live there is beyond me. But that's how it is. That's one of the things of history. You're saddled with what you've invested in through generations, through decades, through centuries. And that's what we have to deal with now. Next. And when they anticipate sea level rise in climate change, this is the kind of picture that everybody in the Netherlands is now familiar with. The heart of Rotterdam being flooded, the most famous modern market being flooded. Next. And not only that, not only in the cities, where they have actually recovered agricultural land by managing the water, it can go back underwater. Then what do you do? No food. Next. And still, they are saying that the cities are going to grow, the population is going to rise. And my God, you know, is it right? <laughs> I don't know, but this is how it is. Uh, the same in India, as we saw in the first, you know, the map of India with the urbanization pattern that we saw along the coastal edges. So this is, this is interesting, but it's, a it's something that we really have to confront very realistically. Next. And this diagram is, of course, a vertically exaggerated scale. And what you see on the right-hand side is one of the rivers whose level, the river goes and empties out into the sea. So it's at a high level, it empties out into the sea, which is also at a high level. Then there is a lake or a, or a large body of water which is at a lower level, and then there are fields and villages and so on at much lower level in relation to the river. And that's how it is being maintained day after day, decade after decade. Next. And this is a diagram that explains how actually this is done. On the top left-hand side is the river. Then next to the river is a bund that is being raised now slowly so that if the river water and the sea level was to rise even further, it will still not overflow the bun. But the land that is already below the river level has these water channels and these water channels are connected to a larger channel and they go to a pumping station where you see there's little three red buildings. There's a pumping station that pumps the water up and out into the river. And this has to be kept going constantly. And that is why the windmills were really working because there happens to be constant wind across the plains of the Netherlands. And so the windmills would actually work as constant pumps. But now, of course, they've turned to electric pumps, right? More powerful, centralized, keeping it as an overall system. You can see the structure of the system is really quite simple. And they've tried to make it as durable as possible with only a few but concentrated moving parts where the pumps are located, okay? And they build in redundancy into the system. If one thing should fail, something else should be able to take over. And from the lower level of the immediate surrounding of the houses to the level of the river and the locks along the length of the river, there's an uplinking of all the systems that manage the water levels. Next. And this is, you know, the height of adaptation. The height of adaptation. Uh, you have to somehow plan to be able to survive the impact of climate change, of rising sea level. Here you can see how the bund has really grown even taller than the houses themselves. And the houses remain where they were. But you know what? They realize that they've been relying on electricity a lot. And if they're going to fight climate change and honor their commitment vis-a-vis the climate change agreement, COP21 agreement, they better change their overall energy strategy. Next, that would be mitigation. While you adapt, you must also mitigate. So what they say is there's a huge potential of making energy out of biogas from the peat, the rich peat, which produces a lot of methane, in the, in the low-lying lands of the Netherlands. You can also get some wind energy 
and only a little bit of solar PV because it's very cloudy weather out there. So you can see, depending on the opportunities of your location, you can still move towards a hopefully a net zero 2050 by taking advantage of what is available to you and devising technologies to take advantage of what is available to you. Next. Right, from the extreme of climate change affecting a whole nation, right, to a small project in the heart of the desert. This is in the heart of the Rajasthan desert where it rains three times in a day, three times in a year. And so what they do is they build shallow bowls, which they call pythons. And in the center of the shallow bowl, they would have a well. And that would be the water source for the community that surrounds that python, or there might be two or three pythons for a village. So in this house, there is a python built on the top of a, of a sand dune. And in the center, there is a well, the circular thing. And slung across the well, and cutting across the python is a small house, which is two rooms. And this house is nestled into the ground. It's nestled into the ground. And so as it sits on top of the sand dune, it is protected from the rising of the sands and from the hot winds, because it is in a kind of, it is, it is also protected because it is nestled into the ground. It's a very simple, durable solution. And it's very amazing passive performance. It manages to be autonomous in water, not yet autonomous in power, it can be. And the people who use this place really know how to run it, how to make use of it. And they also are quite prepared that if anything else, you know, if anything should go wrong in terms of flooding or extreme storms, they would know what to do. They know that they have to just you know, go onto the rooftop. Next. So here you can see on the side is the edge of the dune behind which you have the python. And the, the tall curvy walls are on either side of a roof terrace where you can sleep at night and facing east and west with views across the desert are deep verandas. And the house is around a well of water and nestled into the ground. So it enjoys the benefit of relatively stable temperatures at two, three meters below the ground. Next. Here it is. You can see how it sits. And now they've grown once again. Uh, it's a kind of a, a mini design of the Jodhpur thing of the Jodhpur campus. It's a mini design of the Jodhpur campus. Next. This is the roof terrace, where you can sleep at night. And it's also the place with, if anything should happen in terms of the lower floors of it getting, getting inundated or the, the well breaking its sides or leaking, you can always come to the top. Next. A story again, back into the seas of community action. This is one of the islands in the Maldives. One of the most vulnerable, vulnerable communities in the world and a nation in the world, which is subject to sea level rise impact. They also have, they're also subject to storms and tsunamis. And of course they have to face temperature rise. And for producing electricity, you know, so far they've been using diesel generators as an issue. And even making, you know, using the rainfall and trying to keep uh, non-saline sweet water available for drinking, that's also a problem because water is ingressing into all their uh, subsoil areas from the sea. Next. But here's a beautiful example. On the left-hand side is a school which has got solar PV on the roof. So if there is a citywide uh, electricity breakdown, this is one place where you will have electricity. Uh, it's well stored and sufficient for simple living. Uh, and on the right-hand side is a hospital building. And they have a, a rehearsal every few months 
where all the school children gather in the school courtyard and they file down the street some eight to 10 minutes walk away to this hospital uh, where they come onto the first and the second floors and uh, in case there is a big storm and a big flood that inundates the island. So the Maldives has a resi resilience plan for every neighborhood. And really, and every school child knows what the resilience plan is. And every neighborhood, neighborhood knows where they have to go for safety if there's a flood. Next. Right, so knowledge and awareness are extremely important. Someone always needs to know how the building's critical systems work. Will it be the user or the resident? Or if it is a big project or big building, will it be the building manager? Or will it be a combination of two? Some things that the residents must know, the users must know, and something that the building manager is responsible for. Will there be an operations and maintenance handbook? Will it be simple enough for people to interpret and use? Or will it be like some Sanskrit text? Will there be fallback options uh, if something should go wrong? Will there be redundancies and fallback options? Will there always be the possibility of overriding automation by manual devices? If you're always dependent on opt automation and something goes wrong, you're stuck. Like in a lift, nothing can happen. So you might have to think about how there should be manual overrides for all critical uh, system. Say if you need to pump water, would you have a bicycle pump that you sit on the bicycle and pump, pedal the bicycle and pump the water up rather than be dependent on electric pumps? Would you do something like that? Next. And then, no building or no place in itself is by itself. It is uh, connected to a community at large, to the city and its community support services. It is also uh, connected to disaster forecasting. Now we have on the internet, we have disaster forecasting and we have access to it on our phones. And nowadays across India too, there is something called disaster management centers, especially in disaster prone areas, and they have emergency service facilities. Would there not be an app that residents or users of a building have, which will tell them, you know, to connect across all these three things, send messages, receive messages, receive instructions, give a status report and find out what to do. And this should be a very simple app to operate. Next. All this activity in our part of the world, which, which we consider to be a developing country. So designing for resi resilience actually is something that we are doing in the broader context of a developing country. What does that mean? It means that you have to have innovative solutions that are scalable and affordable, or shall I say affordable and therefore scalable. That's very important. We can devise all kinds of things that will go to the moon, you know, but they will remain something which is not really affordable today. So an intelligent design would be close to the reality of the ground and find a solution for what we are confronting today, even as we prepare for the future. Don't forget in these sustainable, since sustainable development goals, the SDGs, Number 13 is something called climate action. So in everything that we do in building design, climate action is one of the aspects that we are looking at. Next. Well, going back to your training, your, your self-study module, you will remember that there's a big box tier one at the bottom, which is passive design, right? Uh, then there's tier two, which is passive systems. 
and then there is tier three, which is the active system. So the basic configuration, shape, arrangement, materials, formation of the building is what is going to give you the greatest benefit. And then those things like doors and windows and insulation and other systems like water circulation and so on will give you, will make that even better. But they're really, they're slightly more complicated, but also relatively simple. And the complicated stuff, which is dependent on the use of energy at the moment, the tier three, that needs to be the smallest element of your demand. You have to maximize tier one and tier two and minimize tier three. But that is where electricity is required. How can you improve or maximize the comfort hours that you get inside the building without the use of any electromechanical system? That's the question. Next. And well, here is a list of things. I will not go into them in detail, but at the building level, there are many little actions that are taken which anticipate the hazard and risk in the future. And by taking these, these measures, you are now becoming more resilient as a building. For instance, just raising the plinth, you study what the flood level is likely to be and make sure that you raise the plinth above it or put stills. Just a simple measure, but it's really, you know, looking into the future and taking a simple action today. That's one example. And there are many, and same with plantation, for instance, uh, intelligently planting things where they will be beneficial, where they will provide shade, where they will last in choosing the right kind of trees. These are simple things which have long lasting effect. Next. And you can check those out. All those things that I mentioned in that circle, you can check those out. Very important, two essential things, sufficiency and autonomy for critical functions. Many of these critical functions are dependent on electricity. Um, and so, how will, be, how will you be autonomous on the electricity front, on the power front? How will you be autonomous on the water front? If you can't bring it from elsewhere or bringing it from elsewhere is going against the mitigation actions of climate change, then you need to be self-sufficient and autonomous as much as is possible. And you can measure it. Next. And here's the question that we need to answer. How many hours in a year can the building provide comfort without using mechanical devices? We looked at that earlier. What other measures are implemented for disaster and risk reduction? That was the second thing. And how many days of autonomy? Think of building a water requirement and power requirement. Autonomy for critical functions can the building itself provide. Very important consideration. Is that the end? Oh, we got something more coming. That's it. Questions? Yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir, for the presentation. And um, we'll take questions now. Um, so we've had questions coming in as we were going through the presentation. So the first question is, what are the possible methods to provide a balance from flood problems in urban floodplains? Well, there are three broad strategies. <clears throat> One strategy is what we call a, a bunding strategy, like we saw in the case of the Netherlands or the buns that were built in the Sundar, Sundar buns or the bund that is proposed by the students for Mumbai. So you raise a bund uh, to protect yourself from the direction from which water is going to rise and flood you. That's one strategy. Second strategy is a complementary one where you say that if the water should come, it should be able to flow out easily. If, it, if there's a lot of water coming, it should be able to flow out easily. So there should not be no blockage of water 
where there is an existing water course, allow the water flow to flow through. But where there's a flood plain, it doesn't flow through because the sea water level has risen or the, the, the water is not flowing through, but it is building up. So in order to fight building up, we need to have holding ponds, spaces which are dug into the ground or ditches that are dug into the ground where the water can collect. It's otherwise dry during the dry season, but when it rains hard and there's about to be, you know, the flooding is about to happen, that is where the water fills in first and then waits, you know, and then it starts percolating into the ground, waits for the storm to be over and gradually then percolates into the ground. That's the second strategy. The third one is raise the building, raise it on stilts so that it is clear of the, of the, of the anticipated water level. And have boats, right? Have amphibious vehicles. I think amphibious vehicles is fantastic. You know, it's a great, great idea. Next. Thank you. Um, next question. Um, can a building be constructed without raising on stilts in floodplain situations? Very interesting. Um, in, in Thailand and in the Netherlands, there's been a lot of, lot of R&D where they have designed buildings which are tethered to the ground but built on, on, on pontoons, hollow, hollow vessels on which they're rested, okay? So when the water builds up, the building rises with the water. When the water recedes, the building settles down again. So that has been done, that's been tested, but it has not been tested to scale yet, but there's some active thinking going on along those lines. Ashok, I want to add here um, that in New York City is passed new bylaws uh, mm. that uh, allows the or that requires the lowest floor mm. uh, uh, or the floor that's in the floodplain to be sacrificial in a sense where mm. you don't have habitable uh, spaces in there. That's right. Whatever is flooded can can be flooded, and then for things like shops and stores, uh, they require that uh, uh, the construction bin is done in a such, such a way that the windows and doors can still be above the, the flood level. Yeah, so that's an interesting bylaw, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, in, in adaptation, I mean, as we've seen everywhere, um, you know, the, what the shopkeeper does is he lifts all his goods and takes it upstairs, you know. So uh, if, you, if you have anything that is kept downstairs where it's flooding, it should be such that you can lift it up, take it away, take it upstairs, or keep it at a higher level, all right? Jack it up, something. So there are ways of handling this. Um, but for historical reasons, we want to be on the ground because life is on the ground, the street is on the ground, access is on the ground, and so on and so forth. Thank you, sir. Next question. As you said, this is a new challenge. What skills do we as designers need to acquire for working on resilience? Oh, that's what we have to learn from you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the first, first step is to confront the challenge square on and understand its reality. You know, let's say we're talking about temperature rise slowly. Let's, talk, let's say we're talking about peaking of temperatures. So if peaking of temperatures is going to be a real thing, we need to know what happens inside the building when temperatures peak, okay? Um, and so you a, a better understanding of building physics, for instance, I'm just thinking aloud. If you have a very heavy thermal mass, which is protected from the outside, if the peak lasts a short while, let us say a day or two or three days, the building will be okay. Not much will happen to the inside. But if the building is very leaky and it has very low thermal mass, then you're going to feel the peak very you know, intensively. So it's really like you have, on, so on temperature front, uh, you need to understand, you need to develop skills of building, building physics and understanding of building physics really well. If you're looking at the threat of, say, uh, 
heavy storm, wind, wind, wind pressure, wind loads, roofs blowing off, or buildings being keeled over because of the pressure of the wind, or, or flooding, uh, then you need to understand hydrology because it can aff affect your foundation. So there are a lot of technical skills that would be required. And that is why, as a part of this project that we've got, we know that none of us can do this individually on the basis of our own individual knowledge. It would require teamwork between experts and other knowledge fields for us to really address these issues. That's the learning of the modern world and the, the learning of how to deal and confront complex issues cannot be done individually. Thank you, sir. Next question. In Mumbai, when we get floods, the sewage gets backed up into the flooded water and our underground water tanks get sewage in them. What do we do at a building level in our engineering for that? Oh, very good. You know, in, in that diagram that we had uh, towards the end where we had the circle of actions around a building that was being seen, one of them showed that the underground water tank was raised a little bit so that the entry, you know, so even if the area gets flooded, the flood water cannot enter the water tank, right? So that was a precaution taken over there, just for this reason. It's exactly this reason. So if you anticipate what is going to happen, then you can design for it. So it, understanding risk is terribly important. Predicting risk is terribly important. And of course, you have to take some realistic measure about it because you know you can say you know the only the only way to live is to you know raise everything at least two stories up and keep the water at the top, keep everything at the top, let, let, let the sea flow at the bottom. It just becomes inordinately expensive and complicated. So one, at some stage, you have to take what is called a, a what's it called? Techno-commercial view. Balance the cost and the, and the complexity of technology uh, so that it becomes a reasonably safe solution which is affordable right but i think knowing what needs to be done is the first thing why you need to do it is the first thing and then i'm sure solutions will come to you right thank you sir next question for a small building with the pool in the basement has there been a requirement of heating at some point does the extensive insulation make it uncomfortable in delhi winter that that's no there's actually it's not no no in delhi winter um because it's so well insulated right uh, you don't need any heating and a little bit of sunshine coming in and people inside and use of the computer and use of the the kitchen and all that it stays nice and warm you don't need any heating in winter in that building they haven't switched yeah. it on hmm. I mean, they have, they have an air conditioning system which can be turned both ways, but they haven't used any heating in winter. And okay. they, they, use, use, they use the sunscreens very cleverly. So they let in a bit of sun during the daytime. Um, you know, they, they, they gather the screens in such a way that the sun can come in during winters. Hmm. All right. Uh, thank you. Next question. Can you talk a little bit more about how to tackle humid climate in uh, in Delhi? Yeah, a difficult one. <laughs> How you tackle the humid climate in Delhi? Um, the only way you can deal with the discomfort caused by high uh, relative humidity of the air that surrounds you is to move the air off your body quickly and keep it moving and, you know, let less humid air flow across your body. So a ceiling fan or something that ventilates the space and keeps the air moving across your body is the first strategy you can take. And traditionally, before we had air conditioning, that's what we all did. We would dress lightly. If you were in Sri Lanka, or if you're in the South, we all know that you don't wear anything on the top. At least if you're a man, you don't wear anything on the top. But even if you're a woman, you wear very little, all right? 
so that your skin can feel the breeze and you kept the windows and everything open. So that's the first step. Now, if you feel uncomfortable even then, sometimes it is very still, and there are times when it is very still and warm and humid, the only way you can take care of it is to take the humidity out of the air. Now, that's where complications arise. You have to close off the space and install a machine that by cooling the air below dew point, uh, takes out the moisture from the air and sends the air back into the room. That's an air conditioning system, right? Uh, and that is what you need to minimize. So if you do close the building and if it is predominantly humid, you also need to make sure that no extra humidity enters the building from the outside through cracks of the windows or even uh, through the walls because even though the walls look solid, Vapor can travel across walls unless there's a vapor barrier, okay? It actually is the most difficult problem to address from the point of energy efficiency, humidity. Right, thank you. Next question. Cooled water instead of chilled water in the floor also has the advantage that with cooled water, you will not produce any floor sweating. So you do not need air conditioning. Yeah, well, the advantage simply is that the water cooled by evaporation can never reach dew point. It will be always slightly higher than that, especially when it's circulated in the building. So you will not get sweating in the, on the underside of the slab all right, or on, on the surfaces on the floor or on the ceiling of the slab. Uh, I forgot to mention that when you have this system, there's no such thing as a false ceiling. You, <coughs> your body has to see the cook the cool surface to feel the radiant cool, right? So there's no false ceiling. And this really works quite well, but it has its limitation because you can cool it down only to that extent. If you're using evaporatively cool water, it will only give you that much benefit. If you're using refrigerant system cooled water, you can bring it down close to wet bulb, close to wet bulb and still not let it condense. And you can get slightly better results from it. But I really feel, uh, having you know been to this this uh, this particular building, that they use the air conditioner when it is humid, and they hardly use it at all when it is dry season, because this this cool water system seems to do quite a lot of the work that you need to do, and of course insulation helps a great deal. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Can urban farming also provide resilience? Should we plan for days of autonomy based on amount of farming area we provide in our project? Well, that is, uh, you know, what is now being worked on very seriously across the globe. Um, it is connected with larger issues. It's a good point that you raised because um, transportation of food from one place to the other place, you know, milk, especially fresh stuff that is perishable, vegetables and milk, for instance. If it has to travel a long distance, it has to be refrigerated on the way, it has to be kept and it, you know, the travel costs are there, the carbon footprint of travel is there, the carbon footprint of refrigeration is there. But if it is produced more locally, then less transportation is involved and you can eat more fresh food. At the same time, in the waste to resource cycle of the city itself, the waste that we deposit into the sewer systems or the leftovers of our food or the waste that comes off uh, the plant growths, you know, the, the leaf fall and all of that. If all of that is composted and can be used to grow food locally, then once again, you're taking care of the waste without having to carry it to a great distance and then treat it artificially and then deal with it in some other way, et cetera. So this idea of a closed loop in the waste to waste to treatment to waste, using it as a as compost, uh, as a fertilizer for food, and then that becoming organic food that you can consume is certainly a good idea. So I think it ought to be integrated, but we also know that if you do a calculation to see how much land area you might need or how much, food growth area you might need per capita, 
it's very difficult to integrate it into the density systems that we have at the moment. Okay? But certainly it's a strategy towards which we should be moving. Thank you, sir. Next question. Can you suggest something for cold climates as well? Oh, Excess sure. anticipated snowfall during winters is no less than a hazard for the habitants. Electricity and telecom systems get disrupted and food is limited. So, so I'm sure you know the answers already. Hmm. <laughs> well, stock up, stock up, insulate well, build a roof that can not collapse under, under the weight of the snow and face the sun. Face the sun, catch the sun through your glass and store it inside the mass of the building. And then, make, you know, that these are the three things that you can do, definitely. Uh, another thing, of course, I mean, this is something that's been done in some parts of the world where they have very well managed forest uh, resources, right? So you use uh, dead hardwood harvested from the forest in very efficient uh, wood-fired uh, heating systems which lie in the center of the house. So you actually store the heat from the fire of the wood into a big mass of concrete which sits in the middle of the house and then that radiates the heat slowly uh, to the surrounding rooms and spaces as against using a chimney, which just burns away. Most of the heat just goes out to the flow, uh, to the flue, and you burnt a lot of wood, right? It's, it's in a sense, it's analogous to what we the smokeless chula idea, analogous to that. But it means that you're using uh, a, you know, a timber resource, which is, re which can be regenerated, but it should be, should be responsibly harvested. So that's another thing, a little bit on the fringe, but I think the first three things that I mentioned are perhaps the way that you, you can be looking at it. Right, thank you. Uh, next question. So on slide 29, uh, the one designed with flash floods and high temperature, this is the great annoyed example uh, mm -hmm. that the, the, the person is talking about. Mm -hmm. The building's longer facade faces directly the west direction. Mm. Is there any strategy to combat high temperatures in this building envelope? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the factory buildings uh, have the long facade facing east and west or sort of south, southeast, northeast and southwest. That's how they face, okay? Um, so first of all, the external walls are all built out of an insulating material, so lightweight concrete block. And then outside all of the windows, we've got shading systems that have been installed that cut out direct insulation onto the window pane from about middle of March to about middle of October. All right, that's the cooling season. That's the season when it gets too warm. After that, you allow the sun to come in. So that's been done on both those, both those facades, but because of the shape of the site, the layout of the factory, that is something that had to happen. Uh, in the office building, it's more compact, it's a squarish thing, and, and you know, with the, with the deep reveals and overhangs, um, and on the southwest phase, which is the worst phase in terms of solar impact, there is this additional kind of uh, baffle wall with pergola on the top and plantation at the bottom to protect against the southwest sun. That's how it is managed. Right, thank you. Uh, next question. Can you suggest where we can look for tickle foundation and how it can be used for individual dwellings? Sorry, what foundation? Tickle, T-I-C-K-L-E. I'm afraid I don't know what it is. You'll have to ask someone else. I right. think that they're asking about trickle fountain. Ah, trickle fountain. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, that's what I thought, but then I thought yeah. it's a trickle fountain. The trickle fountain idea is simply that um, trickle fountain means that you don't have to move too much water. 
right? A small pump that raises the water to some level and then it trickles down against wires, right? Or strings or on some sort of a surface. And because it trickles down against wire or a surface, it evaporates or some of it evaporates. And then the remaining water that comes down is the water which is at well pump temperature. So it's not about gush of water, it is about a trickle of water that has time to evaporate as it is coming down from above to below into the pool again. And that's how it works. So in this Noida building, we have a big pool with lots of water in it with a trickle fountain installed over it. So actually you find that that lot of water itself is a kind of a thermal flywheel. The, the courtyard just feels cooler. And especially when the trickle fountain is on. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, next question. Can the app also have critical building operation manual or instructions for that? Surely, why not? Yeah. yeah. Um, next question. Uh, can you suggest some passive strategies to reduce humidity in a location like Mumbai? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> You know, there, there has been some work which has been done uh, using solar energy uh, to uh, use desiccant, all right? So, so you have liquids and salts that are desiccating liquids and salts. And so when you pass the air through them, they will absorb the moisture and then they will get saturated with the moisture. And then you have to pass <coughs> hot, dry air over it so that the moisture is lost again to the outside atmosphere. And in a sense, you recharge the desiccant using solar energy. So that is a cycle which has been used. <coughs> Some work has been done in it. I don't know of any real scaled installation that has worked for largish complex buildings or for things like you know a block of flats and stuff like that. It does mean that when you are looking at reducing humidity, um, you have to close yourself off from the humid outside. You know, if blowing air is not sufficient for you to give you comfort, and if you want to bring down the humidity in the air, you have to extract the vapor from it. And so you can extract it by cooling the air down so that the vapor just falls off when it reaches the dew point. Or you have to use a desiccant. These are the only two ways that we know that it can be done. But it does mean you close off the building when you do so. And if you think of, if you go to the Passive House website, which is this German organization, what they do is they completely close off the building from the outside and just allow enough ventilation, which is good enough to give you oxygen to breathe in, to live in, all right? And so, and they wrap the building with vapor barriers, insulation and vapor barriers, completely wrapped. So that practically no humidity can enter the building from the outside. And so inside you can remove the humidity using uh, some sort, you know, something like a refrigeration system. Just, you know, you can use a, a dehumidifier to remove the humidity. With some electricity, it works like a refrigeration system as far as I understand. But you know, that's why well, you can do that. You can do that, but it really does mean you have to close yourself off from the outside. Right, um, uh, we'll take a couple of more questions. Um, and uh, the next question is, can radiant cooling be done in hollow core concrete slabs? Radiant cooling can be done in hollow core concrete slabs if you, you, you pass cool air through the hollow cores, right? Now, the thing about using air as a way of charging the cools, as against water as a way of charging the cools, is that air has very uh, low, what's it called? What's it called? Thermal, what's it called? Specific heat, right? Hmm. So it cannot carry much cools 
in its flow as compared to water. Very little bit of water will carry a lot of coolth and absorb a lot of heat from the, from the structure surrounding it. But if you're relying on air, you'll have to move a lot of air to get the same effect that the water will give you with very little movement. So using something with high specific heat like water is generally more advantageous. And also you actually need the mass of the slab, you know, rather than the, if you hollow out the slab, the mass is reduced. So you need the mass of the slab in which to store the cools, right? Right, yep. And one last question for today. Uh, would plants in interior work as a passive strategy in cold climates too? What do you mean passive strategy? Will they warm up the space inside? I, I think so. I mean, when they talk about cold climates, uh, that's what we intend to do. If it is very dry, say if you're in Mongolia, all right? in the deserts of Mongolia, where it is very dry, cold outside, okay? Um, so if it's very dry air inside your house, you, you lose a, a lot of your, your warmth by evapotranspiration because the body loses the moisture very quickly. And therefore you feel chilly all the time. But if you humidify the air inside, if it's a little bit more humid, you keep it humid inside, then you will not feel so chilly. So keeping plants, indoor plants, watering them, but this works in uh, cold, dry climates very well. Otherwise you don't want to exacerbate, you, want to, you don't want to increase humidity inside. If the air is not moving sufficiently, you increase the humidity inside, you will get fungal growth on the wall surfaces, right? Because the wall, right. External walls tend to be colder. <coughs> you, you'll get fungus growing on it. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, the session today and the Q&A was very informative. And I hope our participants can make the best use of the knowledge, knowledge and practices that you've shared with us today. Uh, Prasad, would you like to add something? Um, sure. Um, thanks, Yashima. Uh, <clears throat> I, I saw that there was an interesting question that uh, Ashok answered quite well, which is uh, what kind of skills do we need, uh, you know, to deal with this new thing that we are trying to work with, which is called, you know, or, or trying to achieve, which is resilience in the face of climate change. And uh, something that we're not used to uh, doing in our architecture and engineering for buildings. And, and Ashok mentioned, uh, you know, many of the things related to things like building science, building physics, uh, understanding the engineering, etc. So I, I think uh, I, I want to remind the participants that um, as part of Solar Decathlon India, there are 53 people who are available to you as technical resource group members. Uh, they have actually been through this competition before and, and, and are now young professionals who have these skills, who have some of this knowledge. And that's a huge knowledge base that, that you have access to. So, uh, you know, the technical resource group members, uh, you can find them on, on the website. Uh, you can look up what their expertise areas are, or you can look them up on the learning platform, get in touch with them, start talking to them. You are now going to get into areas of design that become more complex and you need to make them integrated and you need to investigate the science, the physics, the engineering, and these expertise areas more and more. So this is a good time to start getting in touch with those uh, technical resource group members and start developing your relationships with them. Thank you, Prasad. And uh, with that, we come to the end of our 10 part technical webinar series for Solar Decathlon India. Thank you everyone for participating and we hope that the learning online program, which includes both the self-learning modules and the webinars has been helpful in providing you with a perspective on how to design energy efficient buildings and that you will be able to apply these concepts in your design. We will see you in the new year on sessions to soft skills on how to improve them for your Solar Decathlon India entry. Thank you, Ashok, sir. And thank you, Prasad. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. And best of luck to the participants. Uh, best of luck to everyone. Yes.
Thank you.